Thanks for checking out the weekly sermon from Church of the Resurrection. I pray that God will use this message to speak to you and help you grow in your faith journey. If you're in the KC area, I'd like to invite you to join us next week at one of our services or join us in live worship online at core.org worship. Church of the Resurrection is one church in multiple locations. To learn more about the service times and our ministries, please visit core.org. Hope you enjoy this week's message. My name is Allie Drummond, and I serve as one of the pastors here at Church of the Resurrection. And as we continue in worship together, I invite you to hear these words of scripture from the book of Acts. Jesus said to his disciples, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. In Romans eight, we read these words. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies also through his spirit that dwells in you. And in Paul's first letter to the church in Corinth, we hear, there are different spiritual gifts, but the same spirit. And there are different ministries in the same Lord. And there are different activities, but the same God who produces all of them in everyone. A demonstration of the spirit is given to each person for the common good. May God add a blessing to the reading, hearing, and understanding of scripture. Many of you know that Church of the Resurrection is one church in multiple locations. We've got five Kansas City area locations, two on the Missouri side of Kansas City and three on the Kansas side of Kansas City. And of course, many of you join us from across the country or around the world. And I'm preaching from our Leewood location, which is just across the state line into Kansas. And uh, I gotta tell you a little bit about Kansas right now. No offense to the Missouri people, because I love Missouri as well. Uh, I got family in both, both places, but you know, I gotta tell you, Kansas might just have the most beautiful sunsets of anywhere in the world. And if you drive across Kansas, you'll have a chance to see the Flint Hills and they are magnificent. And the sunflower fields, you know, it's just awesome. And watching the waving grain. And of course we have Dorothy and the Wizard of Oz and a whole host of other things, including some of the nicest people on planet earth in the state of Kansas. And I know Missouri people are nice and everywhere else too, but I'm just telling you as a, as a guy who grew up in Kansas, we got some really nice people around here. But what we're best known for, at least for folks who are in the know, is producing wheat. And we are the largest source of wheat in the, in the United States. Uh, we produce annually 320 million bushels of wheat. A bushel is 9.25 gallons or 9.26 gallons. This is a bushel right here. And we produce 320 million of those, number one in the, in the United States. And, uh, and that is the equivalent of, if you take a standard loaf of bread, a pound and a half loaf of bread, that's 13 billion 400 million loaves of bread that come out of the wheat that we produce in Kansas every single year. We know wheat. And not those of us in the city maybe, but those of us out in the rural areas, we produce a lot of wheat. Now, uh, I want you to know that in Kansas, we have just finished the wheat harvest. So it started in the Eastern part of the state and the combine teams move across to the Western part of the state. And I think they're just wrapping up right now near the Colorado border. And so, uh, so a lot of wheat being produced this last month. And that tied in with this sermon series. So we're in the midst of a summer revival in which we're talking about God and tractors. And this is part of what inspired this is this is a time, not for the city dwelling folks like me and the, the folks in the, in the suburbs, but for folks outstate, a lot of tractors doing a lot of powerful work right now to feed a lot of people. And, uh, and so our summer revival, we're talking about lessons learned from God and tractors. You'll see behind me, my own tractor, that's my John Deere 3020. And there are people I know who ask when I travel to Boston or somewhere like, you know, do all of you have cows in your backyard in Kansas? No, we don't all have cows in our backyard. We got dogs and cats and, and, uh, and most people, you know, have cows live outside of the cities. Most people don't have tractors like this in the city, but I got a few acres and and I just love tractors. And so, so anyway, you know, this is my tractor. And, and today I wanna to talk to you a little bit about tractors. And I wanna tell you the history of tractors as a way of getting at what the Holy Spirit does in our lives. So we're gonna talk tractors first and we're gonna talk a little bit about the wheat harvest and then we're gonna go into tractors. So I wanna remind you that, you know, something we've all heard before, that, that uh, dictum that necessity is the mother of invention. And when it comes to tractors, tractors were invented because people are moving to cities and the folks living out in rural areas had to produce more food with less hands than they'd ever had before. 
and on less, you know, more food on, on fewer acres. I mean, they started consolidating farms, but they had to produce food for all the people who were moving to the cities. And so you had to come up with a better way of doing what you were doing before. So I want to tell you just a little bit about the, the wheat harvest. So the way it's been done from time immemorial was the use of a hand sickle. This is my great grandfather's hand sickle. And so as you're cutting the wheat, you come along and, and that cutting of the wheat, that, that cutting it down with a sharp blade was called reaping. And so, you know, the phrase, you reap what you sow. Well, uh, this in particular was reaping wheat. You had sown wheat, you're reaping wheat, and this is how you did it. You did it with a hand a sickle. Later on, you learned how to, you know, the, the, scythe, was, the scythe was invented, and, and this allows you to, to cut a lot more wheat than you could do in, uh, with just the hand sickle. And so these are all tools that helped people to be able to harvest more grain. So I want you to see what this looks like when it comes to harvesting grain, and, and the Amish still do it this way. Many of them do. Uh, take a look. And so you see the hand sickle and, uh, and cutting out the wheat in this field. And then it's gathered together in sheaves. These are called sheaves bound together. And then they're gathered together into shooks. And then those are gathered and they are put in a threshing machine, which beats the, the, uh, the kernels off of the stalk. And then after this, the, the uh, wheat is, in this case, would be, would be thrown in a bucket up into the air. Uh, you know, and you would have, especially on a windy day, it would, it would blow away the chaff, all the, all the little husks around the, the wheat kernels, and what you would have left was, was wheat. And so this is a whole process. And when you think about these terms, these are all things that show up in the Bible. Again, you know, you reap what you sow. I mean, it comes out of this kind of harvesting. The sheaves, and you may remember the old, uh, the old gospel, him bringing in the sheaves, which was about, you know, Christ's return and, and the harvest, you know, harvest time. And, and the idea of, uh, of shooks, this is a picture, by the way, of shooks. Uh, and, and so these are stacks of sheaves that are bound together and, and, uh, and then they're dried waiting for harvest. And then finally, of course, we have threshing, which is the beating of the grain. And as you're beating the grain, you are, uh, you are separating it from the, the husks. And then finally, after that, you end up with winnowing. And winnowing is again, where you're separating the wheat from the chaff. So all these terms show up again and again in the Bible. But, but here's the thing, in the 19th century, people began to invent, invent machinery that would expedite this process, that would allow a farmer to do more with less, that would give them greater power. And that started uh, with steam and steam engines. So uh, at the time in the 1800s, steam engines were invented uh, used on trains and a whole host of other things, uh, but also on the farm. Uh, wheels were set on them and they couldn't drive themselves, but they were pulled out by teams of horses and they were pulled out rocks and they were pulled out to the field. And then that belt was connected to its movement, its, its uh, pulley system. And it was hooked up to different kinds of machines like the thresher. And I saw this video this week and spoke with the guy in England who had, who had shot it. I want you to see it. This is a steam thresher. And uh, I want to thank Harry Rogers in Seven Oaks, England for allowing me to use this. So, so that machine, that steam machine was brought out by, by horses. Uh, a pulley is hooked up to the steam thresher behind it. The steam thresher then is, uh, is working to take the wheat and it's beating it to separate the kernels. And then from that, it's separating the wheat from the chaff. And then what you find left in the end, it's amazing. This is from the 1800s, if I'm not mistaken. It was modified with the tires later on. But, but what you find in the bottom is you find this, uh, you know, you find all of the grain that's there. So, so this is, you know, this suddenly uh, was able to produce with this kind of machinery, what a human couldn't do in days and days, it could be produced, you know, in, in hours. I mean, it was amazing. And then later on, they began to uh, put power drives to those steam engines, and they created steam-propelled tractors. This is a picture of one from the Deanna Rose Farmstead, not far from our church. And you can see in the back where the coal would be kept, and, and then it would pull behind it implements. So suddenly, you're able, instead of having horses pull things or oxen, you have a tractor, a, you know, a steam engine that's pulling these things. And then uh, I want you to see the 150-horsepower case steam tractor from, eight, uh, from 1905. If you'd show that on the screen... This is amazing. Now this tractor, <clears throat> built in 1905, there are none left. This was rebuilt from the original plans, but it was able to pull, you know, I don't remember, like 18 bottom uh, plows, you know, 18 plows across a field just on the strength of that one tractor. But the thing was, those things were super heavy and they were pretty hard to operate. <clears throat> So in uh, 1892, a man named John Froelich invented uh, a gasoline-powered tractor. That was going to be a game changer. Now, this is a picture of Froelich and his tractor, and you stood on the front and drove it this way, but it didn't need steam anymore. You didn't have to be feeding the, uh, you know, feeding the steam engine anymore. Much lighter was able to do things that the steam tractors couldn't do. It was a disaster. Uh, he sold two, and I think they were both returned. Um, but there were other people who picked up the idea. So in 1905, there were a pair of guys, Hart and Parr, who, who uh, actually were the first ones to coin the phrase tractor. Before that, they were uh, mechanical traction units, but they, they uh, coined the phrase tractor and they created a gas-powered tractor that actually succeeded. They sold 15 of these things. Take a look. 
And I love looking at that. I mean, is that not astounding to see? But that was one of the first commercially successful, if not the first commercially successful tractor. And you started it with the flywheel you saw it on the side. You actually would pull that thing down to get the thing started. People would break their hands or their arms while they were trying to start these things. And then after that, so uh, Froelich went back and he with a couple of other guys started the Waterloo Gasoline Traction Engine Company. And, uh, and so they made another run at this thing and they eventually ended up making a successful product called the Waterloo Boy. And, uh, and this is the Waterloo Boy. This is an ad for the Waterloo Boy. And this, was, uh, this came out, I think, in 1913 and very successful. They ended up selling, selling hundreds, I think 800 units, maybe more than that, maybe thousands of units of this. The first really significant commercially successful gasoline tractor. And, uh, and this thing was kind of hard to start too. I want you to see uh, a little footage of them starting one of these Waterloo Boys. Take a look. So here they go, watch the crank. And there it goes. It was amazing. So these things revolutionized tractors even further. Now they started adding implements on the back that were lighter weight, <clears throat> some that could be a little heavier, that could accomplish all kinds of things on the farm. Now there was a company that was making these implements. They'd been making them to be drawn by horses and oxen. And then they started making them to be drawn by tractors. And they decided, you know what? We need to get into the tractor business. These guys have figured something out. And so they bought the Waterloo tractor business and the tractor works and, uh, and began producing these under their own name. And their name was John Deere. And so 100 years ago, 1918, is when John Deere bought the Waterloo Boy, a tractor company, and the rest, as they say, is history. Now, I, I do want to get to our sermon on the Holy Spirit, but I, I, thought I'd enjoy, I thought you might enjoy hearing from a, tra uh, a farmer in our own community. Uh, his wife is a leader in our congregation, Catherine. Uh, Nick Guterman and his family farm thousands of acres just south of, uh, of where the church is. And, uh, and I thought you'd enjoy hearing him talk about his tractors and how tractors have changed things, and then how his tractors have changed, his family tractors have changed over time. Take a listen. Before tractors, predominantly farming was done with animals, whether horse or oxen, and then tractors come about that kind of took their place to be more productive to pull implements. So this tractor in particular is a 3020. It was had a four-cylinder engine. It was a little bit smaller, more for maybe pulling a small plow or a little planter, uh, doing small yard work, pulling a little mower. The 4020, it was, this was my dad's planting tractor. He'd pull two four-row planters hooked together. And then this was John Deere's workhorse, the 7520. That was used for, for tillage and, and doing big horsepower jobs. One horse would maybe pull a one bottom plow or a team of horses would pull a two or three bottom plow. Whereas this tractor here would pull uh, an eight or nine bottom plow um, with ease. So, you know, 10 times productive is an, is an individual horse. And this was actually our planting tractor right here is a John Deere model 4455. This is what we use to plant our corn from basically 1980 until the early 2000s before we transitioned to more modern day tractors, which was what we have over here. The John Deere 8R series, when this one be in a 320 horsepower John Deere 8R, that it can pull a 36 row planter and also has modern day technology where it sends and shares data with the cloud so we can see real time uh, performance what this tractor is doing. I think that is astounding. I just love this stuff. And, and thinking about that tractor being able to plant 36 rows at a time, as opposed to somebody hand planting and drilling that seed into the ground. I mean, it's amazing what it's able to do in order to accomplish what tractors and farmers are meant to do. And that is feed people. That is to produce a harvest. Now, all of this talk about tractors is about pursuing power, the power to do the thing you're meant to do, the mission that you have, the power to be able to do more with less and to do what you couldn't do by yourself. And all of that takes me then to the Holy Spirit. So you might've been wondering like, you know, when is this gonna get to, you know, spiritual things? Well, here it is right here. And I want you to catch this. What tractors are to farming, the Holy Spirit is to the Christian spiritual life. So let's talk about who or what the Holy Spirit is for a moment. In the Bible, the Holy Spirit, that you'll remember, Christians see God in Trinitarian terms. We see God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Father is God. The Holy Spirit is God. The Son is God. We have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And, and it makes my brain hurt to try to fully explain that, but I just know it's true. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit is God's indwelling presence in our lives. And the Greek word in the New Testament for spirit is pneuma, from which you may uh, recognize the word pneumatic. Pneumatic is any tool that's operated by the power of, of wind or air. 
And the word spirit in Greek, again, the pneuma, also means breath or air or wind. It means all of those things. So it can mean spirit, breath, air, or wind. And you just look at the context to see what that means. So the Holy Spirit is the holy breath of God, the holy wind of God, the holy, you know, the air, you know, that we breathe, all of that is, is that's kind of bound up together in the Holy Spirit. In the Hebrew Bible or the Old Testament, it's the same idea. Ruach is the term, ruach. And ruach is this idea, again, of spirit, wind, air, breath, all of these things are what scripture, you know, is this words, these words are what scripture is using to describe the spirit of God. And in the Old Testament, we find that the Holy Spirit was uh, primarily falling upon, you know, people doing extraordinary things. Now, the Bible begins with God creating human beings in the Garden of Eden, and he breathes on them the breath of life or into them the breath of life. The word breath, again, is spirit. It's ruach in Hebrew or in Greek, it would be pneuma. And so God is breathing the spirit into them, his spirit, and, and creating the human spirit. Uh, But after that, most of what we find is the Holy Spirit is primarily in the domain of kings who are going to rule by the Spirit or prophets or, you know, there were times there were the special artisans who had particular gifts and they thought the Spirit of God was upon that person to give them the gifts to be able to create beautiful things. So this is in the Hebrew Bible. But when you get to the book of Joel in the Old Testament, the prophet Joel, Joel makes this promise. He says this, Uh, He says, I will pour out my spirit upon everyone. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams and your young men will see visions. What Joel foretold was realized in the New Testament. The Holy Spirit was a work in the conception of both John the Baptist and in the conception of Jesus. We find the Holy Spirit uh, coming upon Jesus in his baptism. We find he was doing these works, these powerful works of healing and uh, all by the power of the Holy Spirit. And, and then we find that Jesus promises his disciples on the night before he is arrested, or the night he's arrested, the night before he's crucified. And then later on, before he leaves them after his resurrection, he makes this promise, I'm going to send or the Father will send the Holy Spirit to you. The Holy Spirit will be your comforter, will be your guide, your counselor, or will teach you all things that you, know, that you need to know. We'll give you the words to say when called upon to testify. The Holy Spirit will give you, well, here's what Jesus said uh, after his resurrection. He said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. There it is, power. Those tractors were all about harnessing power in order to produce more, in order to do more of what what farmers were trying to do. And in the case of the Holy Spirit's presence in our life, you will receive power. The Greek word is dunamos, from which we have the word dynamite. You will receive power to be God's witnesses, to be Christ's witnesses. What is a witness? Well, it's not just somebody who talks about Jesus. It's somebody who lives their life in such a way that people see a compelling picture of the kingdom of God and of Jesus. The word uh, witness in Greek is martyria, from which we have the word martyr. Somebody who's willing to lay down their life for what they believe. And so being Christ's witnesses and the power to be his witnesses is both what we say, but it's how we live our lives. And and the Holy Spirit will empower us to do that in ways that we could not do on our own. Uh, 120 days after Jesus' uh, crucifixion and resurrection was the day of Pentecost in Jerusalem. It was the harvest day. It was about this time of year, it was uh, June. And uh, and they they were celebrating the spring harvest of the wheat and people gathered from all across the world. It was one of those festivals that Jews gathered in Jerusalem. And as they gathered there, the disciples were in a room with 120 followers of Jesus. They were still afraid to talk about Jesus publicly because Jesus had just been arrested a few weeks and crucified uh, some weeks before. But on this day, what Jesus had foretold actually happened. This is Luke, or excuse me, Acts chapter two, verses one through four. When Pentecost day arrived, they were all together in one place Suddenly a sound from heaven like the howling of a fierce wind filled the entire house where they were sitting. And they saw what seemed to be individual flames of fire alighting on each one of them. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit enabled them to speak. This wasn't kings and prophets. This was ordinary people. They were filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. It looked like flames of fire. This is another way of saying there was power in this room. The howling wind, all of this, the howling spirit breath of God was filling that place. And as they were filled with the Holy Spirit, they could not help themselves. They spilled out into the streets and they began talking about Jesus in ways they'd been afraid to do for the last six weeks. They, were, they had been afraid the last seven weeks, actually. They'd been afraid, but now they were speaking publicly about Jesus again. And they had the power to speak in languages they didn't even know. There were all these Jews from across the world who spoke other languages. They were speaking in those other languages, the good news of Jesus Christ. How did they do that? It was the power of the Holy Spirit. That day, 3,000 people became followers of Jesus. Now, when you read through the letters of Paul, you're going to find that there's a lot in there about the Holy Spirit. In fact, in the New Testament, there are over 300 references to the Holy Spirit or to the Spirit of God in the New Testament. I read every single one of them this week. 
and listened and learned and, and thought, okay, how do I summarize all of this? And I, I can't even begin to summarize it, but I'm going to share with you at least a few scriptures uh, of what the Apostle Paul said about the Holy Spirit in the New Testament. So if you have your Bible, turn to Romans chapter 8. And as you turn to Romans chapter 8, I'd like to invite you to turn to, Ro- to verse 11. Now, the entire 8th chapter of Romans is just filled with this, this teaching about the Holy Spirit and what the Holy Spirit does. But look at verse 11. If the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead, that is, if the Holy Spirit who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies also through his spirit that dwells in you. So God, the father has, has used the spirit to raise Jesus from the dead. And if he will raise Jesus from the dead, how much more is he gonna be at work in your life, helping you overcome your mortal flesh? And this is not just about your death and being resurrected. When Jesus, or when Paul's making this argument here, he's talking about what we talked about last week, the works of the flesh, you know, the sarks, the, the things we tend to do that we shouldn't do. And, and the drives and desires to do things that are unhealthy for us or, or that hurt other people. And he says, if the spirit raised Jesus from the dead, how much more can the spirit help you overcome your own mortal flesh to live the way you want to live? I was thinking about this this week. I asked uh, people on Facebook, you know, tell me how the Holy Spirit has worked in your life. And there was a woman who described how for 40 years she'd smoked and she was trying, trying, trying to stop smoking cigarettes. And, and one day she had been praying about this and she, you know, she's in her car and she lights up another cigarette and she starts crying. Why can't I break this habit? And then she hears this voice in her car. She thought it came from the back seat and it said, do you trust me? I mean, why don't you trust me? And she looked in the back seat and there was nobody there. And, and she instantly understood that God was asking her, the, the Holy Spirit, she believed it was the Holy Spirit in that car with her, asking her, why don't you trust me to help you with this? You can't do this by yourself, but I can help you. And she said, that was the last time I ever smoked a cigarette. He just broke this power in my heart, my mind, when I finally trusted the Holy Spirit to help me. I mean, that's what Paul's talking about here. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is at work in your body, how much more can he help you in overcoming things you cannot overcome by yourself? Look at verses 13 and 14 in chapter eight of Romans. If you live on the basis of selfishness, you're gonna die. But if by the spirit you put to death the actions of the body, you will live. And then I love this line. All who are led by God's spirit are God's sons and daughters. Don't you love that? I mean, if you're led by the spirit, if you're allowing the spirit to lead you, you are a son or a daughter of God. No matter what anybody else says about you, you are a child of God when you allow the Holy Spirit to lead you. And, and we all have the Holy Spirit, we know that. that You know, Paul says, you can't say Jesus is Lord without having the Holy Spirit. If you're in Christ, you have the Holy Spirit. The question is, are you opening yourself up to the Spirit's power and work in your life? Or are you trying to do it by yourself still? Like that woman was in the car after she'd prayed and prayed and prayed, but she'd never let the Holy Spirit be a part of the equation, the power of the Holy Spirit to do this. It's interesting, Paul says that the church is the body of Christ. And he also says the church, you plural, he says in one place, are the temple of the Holy Spirit. So the church is, you know, is indwelt by the Holy Spirit. But he also says in another place, you personally, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit dwells in you. The question is whether you open yourself up to that or ignore it. And, and so part of revival is opening yourself up to the work of the Holy Spirit and recognizing the Holy Spirit is working in you. Go ahead and look down. So you're a child of God. Look at verse 26. The Spirit can, comes to help our weakness. We don't know what we should pray, but the Spirit himself pleads our case with unexpressed groans. Have you ever felt like you don't know what to say, what to pray? I have. And there are times where, you know, all I can do is sigh. And sometimes all I can do is cry. Or sometimes I just groan before God. And, and in the charismatic and Pentecostal churches, they talk about speaking in tongues. These are, you know, it's, it's syllables that don't make any sense. There's no syntax or grammar. And, and, you know, I came out of that tradition. I know what that's like to be able to pray sometimes with you know, just to, to utter what sounds like nonsense to somebody else, but it's just pouring out your, you know, it's the spirit working in you to pour out your feelings and your heart to God and allowing you to pray with groanings too deep for words. Verse 28, I love this verse. It's one that many of you have memorized. In fact, we memorized it here at Church of the Resurrection a couple of years, last year it was, where, during our study of Romans. The spirit comes to help, no, excuse me, verse 28. We know that God works all things together for good for the ones who love God for those who are called according to his purpose. Now the Holy Spirit's not mentioned there, but this is in the context of the Holy Spirit, the whole chapter is. And so how does God work all things together for good? It's not that God forces bad things to happen to you. That's not how God works. He's not punishing you or trying to, you know, force bad things to happen so something better can happen. But here's the thing, bad things happen in our lives, sometimes self-inflicted, sometimes inflicted by other people. Bad things happen sometimes in our lives. Life is hard and difficult and tragic sometimes. But what this says is that God, in the midst of those times, God forces all things to work together for your good. How does God do that? By his Holy Spirit. 
by his Holy Spirit, by his Spirit working in you, who's helping you to be able to, to cope with, to deal with whatever it is you're walking through, by the Holy Spirit working in the hearts of other people who come alongside you to help you, by the Holy Spirit you know, uh, helping you know, form in your mind thoughts and reactions, by, by comforting you and consoling you and carrying you when you don't see any way you can make it through this. And then you look back after time and you see what God did with the pain in your life. How did that happen? It was through the Holy Spirit that all of this happens, all of these beautiful promises. And then you get to the end of the chapter and you reach that dramatic climax. Listen again to these words from Romans chapter eight, verse 35 and following. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors, more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded or convinced that neither death nor life, nor, rule, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. How does that work that when we're going through hard times, we know that we are still with Christ, that he's walking with us, that, that God has not abandoned us. It's through the Holy Spirit who dwells in us. He does not abandon us. So no matter what you're walking through, even through the valley of the shadow of death, the Holy Spirit is with you. The Spirit of God is with you. Consoling, comforting, leading, guiding, forcing good to come from evil, redeeming tragedy and pain, and just promising, look, I'm not going anywhere. I'm with you. The Holy Spirit wants to do all of these things. The question is, are we opening ourselves up to the Holy Spirit's work? Are we listening? Are we paying attention? Are we inviting the Spirit to work in us? Let me just remind you of a few other things Paul teaches us about the Holy Spirit. We had a sermon series a year ago on the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5, and 23. And what we learn is he uses this agricultural metaphor to say the Holy Spirit produces fruit in you as though you were a tree or a bush and you're producing this, but it's the Holy Spirit produces it for you. And so here's what we do is we invite the Holy Spirit to change us, to work inside of us. And the Holy Spirit does what we cannot do on our own. Like the woman who was smoking, there's a whole lot of things I want to be more of, but I can't quite get there by myself, but the Holy Spirit will do this with me. And so I want you to read with me these things. I want us to say this out loud. And what you're going to see on the screen is the scripture memory verse card that we gave you a couple of years ago. And let's say this together. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Which of us doesn't want more of that in our lives? Which of us doesn't want to be more like that? Which of us wouldn't be happier if we had all of those things in our lives? And what Paul is saying is the Holy Spirit produces that in us. What we do is we open our hearts, like we make sure that, our, that the soil of our heart is, is, is open and ready, and that we've pulled out the weeds as best we can, the stuff that shouldn't be growing there, or invited him to do that for us so that we can become what he has described. Then, then there's something else he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. He says, to each is given the manifestation of the spirit for the common good. And here he's talking about spiritual gifts. To one is given through the spirit, the utterance of wisdom. So some people have this ability to say wise things that are, that are beyond themselves. To another, the utterance of knowledge, the ability to know things that you might not know otherwise, to, according to the same spirit. To another, faith by the same spirit, an extraordinary measure of faith. To another, gifts of healing by the one spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, the discernment of spirits. To another, various kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. All of these are activated by one and the same spirit who allots to each one individually as the spirit chooses. So he's saying, this is not the only list. There's other lists in the New Testament of gifts and offices and, and, and things like these, you know, like, like this, where the Holy Spirit, Paul says, you know, the Holy Spirit gives you abilities you don't have on your own. And those abilities are, are, of course, to help you grow in faith, but they're also to help other people. This is why Christianity is meant to be lived in community. You know, to the degree that you're able to come to church, you, you should be together with other people because there are other people who need the gifts that you have and you have, uh, and they have gifts that you need. And so, you know, whatever gift you have, you're meant to be using that and the power of the Holy Spirit to help other people, whether it's faith or service or, or, or witness or, or generosity or, you know, there's all of these gifts in the New Testament the Holy Spirit gives us, but they're all not meant to be just kept for ourselves. They're meant to be used in service to Christ's kingdom and to bless and care for and help other people. All right, you have gifts of the Holy Spirit. I mean, above and beyond the gifts that you were just naturally endowed with, there are certain things when you open yourself up to the Holy Spirit, he gives you gifts to be able to do what you could not do on your own. Those are meant to be used for other people. When I think about this, I think about tractors again, and I think about implements. 
Now, implements are what you hook up to the back of the tractor, and, uh, and there's a PTO a drive at the back of the tractor that, that propels these things. And so I have a handful of implements in my barn at home. You can see them in this little video. And you know, there's my hay wagon. Actually, that belongs to one of our members. That is, uh, that's my old uh, brush hog. There's the plow, or not the plow, but the blade that we use to push the snow in the winter and mud and stuff. There's a, a rototiller. Uh, there's the disc where you disc, with the, you, know, you disc the seed into the ground. On the back of my tractor, you can see there is the... Uh, um, there is the broadcast spreader where I use to spread seed. And, you know, all of these things, I mean, just think about this. Uh, this is the way I would spread seed. You know, if I was trying to do this manually, I would just, uh, you know, I just, I'd get about a quart of seed and I'd be able to spread this around. That, that uh, broadcast spreader on the back of my tractor, that'll hold about a thousand pounds of seed. And with my tractor, I can spread that seed over, you know, I don't know how many acres I could cover with that, but it goes by pretty fast as opposed to, you know, using one of these handheld spreaders or the old fashioned way, just scattering the seed as you go along. I mean, what all of these implements do is they unleash the power of the tractor and the gifts of the Holy Spirit unleash the power of the Holy Spirit in your life and in the lives of other people and in the church when we're all using our gifts for God's greater good and for the good of the community. That's what these implements are meant to do. All right, the Holy Spirit does for us what we cannot do for ourselves, but part of what we have to do is surrender. We invite the Holy Spirit to work in us. So I've been talking about the 12 steps and how 12 steps are really, you know, they're anchored in Christianity. They're all, Christianity is all over them, even though they don't use those same terms. And we talked about the first nine steps of AA uh, over the last couple of weeks. Today, I want to get to steps 10 and 11. Let me remind you, step 10 in the AA, uh, Alcoholics Anonymous uh, 12 step plan. Con we continue to take personal inventory and when we were wrong, we promptly admitted it. It's not enough to just somewhere in the past, I got right with God and right with other people. This is an ongoing continual thing that we have to do in our lives. But then I want you to notice this one. We sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God as we understood him, praying only for knowledge of his will for us and the power, there's that word again, the power to carry that out. I love this. We finally get to near the, the end of the 12 steps. We get to the 11th step. And this is about spiritual disciplines. I'm praying, I'm meditating. I'm not only meditating upon what I have done wrong in the past, I'm meditating on what God wants me to do going forward. And I'm praying that God will help me see and have the knowledge of what that is. That's what Jesus said the Holy Spirit does. He leads you into all truth. He helps you have the knowledge of God's will in your life. And so the 11th step, I'm praying for this and I'm meditating upon this. And then I'm praying for God to give, the, give me the power to do it because remember, we're powerless by ourselves to do very much. We can do some things, but with the power of the Holy Spirit, we can do a lot more. And it's really just such an interesting paradigmatic idea that what Paul says, uh, or what God says to Paul in, in one of his epistles, in your weakness, I am made strong. That's what God says to Paul. So I was reminded of something that, that Tom Langhofer, our pastor of recovery ministry said a couple of weeks ago when we interviewed him about strength and power and weakness Take a listen. What the program and the 12-step program did is it re-centered my uh, focus on Christ. Um, and I surrendered, you know, and surrender was the easiest and yet probably one of the hardest things I've ever done in my life. It might sound counterintuitive that you surrender and you become more powerful but that's truly what happened to me. When I turned my life over to Jesus and let him guide me and to try to follow his will and his way, I became a stronger by, by giving up control and admitting that I was powerless and admitting that I didn't have it all together and admitting that I had weaknesses, um, I became a stronger person. It's amazing how this works when we finally yield ourselves to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit makes us powerful in the moment we think we're weakest. The Holy Spirit guides and leads us, helps us to understand what we wouldn't understand on our own, prompts us and, and nudges us so that we can be a part of God's will. And this is how it happens in the lives of people who are paying attention and inviting the Holy Spirit to work in their lives on a regular basis. I can't do this by myself, but I know, oh God, Holy Spirit, you can do this through me. Here I am, use me. One of the other folks who wrote on, uh, on my Facebook page about how they'd experienced the power of the Holy Spirit in their lives, uh, describe something that happens, you probably have had this happen in your life. It's the Holy Spirit. But she said, my friend Jan and my dad and I all work together. And one day I was alone in the office and I heard a voice say, Jan needs you. Then my phone rang and I answered and my dad said, Jan needs you. He was out of town. I asked if he talked to her. He said, no, I just have this feeling that Jan needs you. 
So she said, I rushed to the hospital where I knew Jan's husband was going through a routine, routine pacemaker procedure. And that procedure ended up going bad. And I just happened to be there when her husband died. How did she know she, you know, how did she hear that voice? Jan needs you. How did her dad hear that voice wherever he was out of town? You need to go see Jan. That's the Holy Spirit laying things on our hearts. And the key is we've got to pay attention. This happens every single week and often every day in my life where if I pay attention, the Holy Spirit will prompt me to do this or call this person or go to this place or, or I'll feel something where the Holy Spirit's speaking to me, something that I need to share with you in a sermon or something else. But if I'm paying attention, I find strength when I'm weak. I find wisdom when I feel empty and have nothing to offer. And I find myself right in the middle of what God wants me to do if I'm just inviting the Holy Spirit to work in me and I'm paying attention. All right, if you want revival, if you want peace and power and hope and joy and to live unafraid, knowing that you're a child of God, what you need is the Holy Spirit. And today I'm gonna invite you to ask the Holy Spirit to lead, guide, and fill you. But before we do that, I wanna come back to the tractor and the sickle and the harvest. So I was curious, you know, how much wheat can somebody with a hand sickle harvest in a single day? You know the answer? It's a third of an acre, a third of an acre. And then you got to let that dry and then you've got to thresh it and, uh, and then you've got to winnow it. So in all of that, it takes two days for a third of an acre. So how much wheat is a third of an acre? Uh, well, that's about 15 bushels. And how much, uh, how much you know, wheat is, uh, you know, how much bread can be produced from 15 bushels? 640 I think it was 640 uh, pound and a half loaves of bread. So that's pretty amazing. Really in two days, it's not just one day, one day to, to harvest, to reap, and the other day to thresh and winnow, um, you can produce 640 standard size loaves of bread. Pretty impressive for a person. Then I thought, what does a tractor, what does a guy do who's harvesting and he's just one guy in the combine and he's driving it, how much can he do with a combine so by the way, you know, we, we see the sickle. I want to show you the combine. This is the John Deere X9-1100. And there's two of them here, but I'm just asking for one person what they were doing. So this is state of the art. These came out, I think, in 19, or 2019 or 2020. So the X9-1100 will cut, thrash, and winnow. Um, not a third of an acre in two days, but 30 acres in an hour. In an hour. In two days, that's not 15 bushels that it will produce. In two days, it'll produce... 22,560,000 or 560 bushels of wheat, enough to make not 630 loaves of bread, but over 1 million loaves of bread. The same guy doing it by himself with a hand sickle or doing it behind the steering wheel or whatever they have of a John Deere X9 1100. And here's my question for you. When you look at the sickle and the X9 1100, which are you going to be? Are you going to be the person who is going to try to do life by yourself without calling upon the power of the Holy Spirit? You're going to be a Christian, but you're going to do it all by yourself. You don't need the Holy Spirit. Are you going to be somebody who says, Holy Spirit, please empower me, fill me, use me, minister through me. And my hope and prayer is you're going to be the person who wants to get behind the combine of the Holy Spirit's power to allow you to be his witnesses, to allow you to live life for him, to live as a child of God, to see his strength, his grace, his leading in your life. If that's what you'd like to do, I'd like to invite you to put your hands like this on your lap and I want us to pray together. Would you bow in prayer with me? And would you just whisper these words under your breath? Spirit of the living God, fill me with your power. Form and shape me. Mold and make me. Guide and lead me. Help me to know I belong to you. Help me to pay attention to your promptings, to listen for your voice. I surrender myself to you. Fill me, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for watching this week's sermon. We'd love for you to join us again online or live in worship. To learn more about Church of the Resurrection, please visit core.org. Have a great week.